I'm Lee Brown. This is Crazy Shit in Real Estate. Today, we're going to go way up north into America's top hat, Canada. We're going to Saskatoon to talk to Chris Molinar. A little reminder to y'all that a little hard work can actually uncover, if not full success, a place to live. So enjoy this conversation and I'll see you on the other side. You're listening to Crazy Shit in Real Estate. You'll be amazed at all these wild but true situations that others have found themselves in. Because on this show, you'll hear uncensored, unbelievable stories from the world of real estate. I'm Lee Brown. Let's dive right in. All right. So tell us a little bit about where you're located, what you do in and around real estate. Tell us a little bit about Chris. I'm in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan in Canada, where I always say most people don't know where that is. It's and way so up I joke in America's top hat. And I say it's north of North Dakota and people are like, is there such a place? But that's where I am located, the middle of nowhere, Canada, or jokingly just outside of the middle of nowhere in Canada. I've been in the business 10 years. I just figured that out. Oh, okay. Work. Yeah, thank you. I was supposed to be a trillionaire by now. I so mean- if you work for the U.S. government or had a bank account in Silicon Valley, you could be a trillionaire with no big deal. That's it. It's funny because you ask realtors, how long do you want to be in the business? And they always say five to 10 years. It doesn't matter if you're day one in the business or you've been in it for 40 years. It's like, oh, I got it. I got another good five to 10 years left because it's always just like, what else am I going to do? But also I'll be rich by then. The truth of it is it's, it is a lot of fun. And I think you have to enjoy what you do. And that's what I've noticed about listening to your podcast is that one of the few real estate podcasts that's actually interesting and fun to listen to, because I find real estate for a lot of people is just like the 1980s slideshow real estate listing channel. Do you remember? You like accidentally stumble upon that channel and you'd fall asleep while watching it. Yeah, because it's always the same. And it's slow motion. It's like, okay, realtors, when you click through the photos, it's like 100,000 miles a minute. You're just like, okay, I saw the listing. But yeah, and I started from scratch. That's kind of, I moved two provinces over. I grew up in British Columbia in the mountains. Oh, and, oh, um, it's so pretty over there, but it's really it, expensive. Well, I just say, if you're not a lumberjack or a coal miner, what are you supposed to do in a small town in the mountains? But I miss it. It's beautiful. But Saskatoon's home now. And yeah, I moved out here as a 19 year old kid, young man, and started my life from scratch. I literally had the clothes on my back and a $1,500 car, which I soon had gotten in an accident and I no longer had that. And I tell people that I was knocking on doors, looking for a place to live and knocking on doors, looking for a place to work and not knowing at the time that was the beginning of my sales training career, so to speak. (laughs) Which is true. It's like, you got to learn how to sell yourself. And so I did find a long lost cousin who took me in for six months and helped me get up on my feet. Are you serious? Wait, no jokes. Door yeah. knocking, you ran into an old cousin? Well, it, was, it was more cold calling the newspaper because back then that was still a thing. I wasn't physically door knocking, but I was cold calling newspaper, looking for a place to work, looking for a place to live. My long lost cousin took me in, which is why I tell people, always work your sphere of influence before you go cold calling and door knocking and you're going to have better results. But I ended up getting into the trades. I grew up in a trades family and I was the only non-mechanically inclined of the bunch, but I was the first to get my ticket and the first and only to get out of the trades. I was not my ambition or passion, but I learned the hard way. It's like, man, I don't know how to use tools. It was green as grass when I started. And then likewise, when I got into real estate, I had some injuries. It was, I think, God telling me that I need to get out of the trades. I busted my Achilles tendon. I had eight months recovery time. Oh, man. Um, and then after that, I busted my other one. And so, okay, this is a sign, get out of the trades. During that time, I started reading some personal development stuff that I met a girl. She called my bluff when I told her I could be or do whatever I want in life. And so she took me to the bookstore and said, we're not leaving till you buy a business book. And so that was the beginning of my self-directed education. I have my trades ticket, so I do have post-secondary education, but really outside of the school of hard knocks, my self-directed education is definitely... I would say really what helped me build my career. Did you pull off the shelf? If she uh, said, go pick out a sales book. You know, what's funny is this is 2008, 2009. And so I found a book. I think it was Robert Kiyosaki, the real book of real estate. And and I bought it because there was a foreword by Donald Trump and I knew who Donald Trump was. Right. But back then, this is not the Donald Trump that we know today, of course. I think he just started The Apprentice. It wasn't like- Yeah, that was when you're fired was the brand right. phrase because people were getting on The Apprentice because they were unemployed. 
That's right. It was just the hair. That was the big thing, right? That was it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not a huge Trump supporter. I don't accept nor deny American politics, but I find that I watch it closer than Canadian politics. Anyways, I bought the book. I want to say a book a week, but now it's kind of transitioned. I listen to a lot more podcasts while I'm working out and stuff and invest in coaching and training and seminars. So it's kind of a different evolution. But I was like, when I started in real estate, green is grass. I did not own any professional attire, right? I had like a ripped pair of coveralls and that was the extent of my wardrobe outside of every other colored solid t-shirt from Walmart. No jokes. I was like bachelor Joe renting a room from a gal. And then, so anyways, I spent, I would say the first year I paid the money to get involved in the Dale Carnegie public speaking training course. Oh, nice. And that changed the game for me because I was so shy and nervous and introverted. And I didn't really have the communication skills when I started to be successful real estate agent. And you always hear, oh, real estate saturated and all this stuff. And so it's just like, I'll do whatever it takes to succeed. And yeah, so, and I invested in sales training and all different kinds of things. And I didn't sell a house for six months when I started. But then I sold one house the next month, and then I sold zero again the next month. And by that time, I was in the bottom of my line of credit. But then I sold five houses the next month, and the rest is history. I became a top producer from that point forward. And everybody at the office was surprised, like, who is this guy come out of nowhere? I didn't think he was going to make it and all this stuff. And then my wife and I, we went overseas, and we went traveling in Europe. And we did that every year since then until we had kids, COVID, all that stuff. It's been quite the journey. Now today, we've got a team of agents all across Canada and into the US a little bit as well. So it's been a lot of fun. Definitely some trials and tribulations. And like I said, school hard knocks, but I think that's the best thing. The problem I have now is how do we make sure that our kids learn the same hard lessons that we did so that they become practical? You don't want them to suffer. What do you do? Well, first of all, let's just point out that you invested in yourself when you had nothing to invest. I think that's one of the biggest mistakes I see professionals make is they say, I can't afford to do self-development. I can't afford to take this class. I can't afford to. And so then they're further and further behind the eight ball. But there's also this reality that I'm going to guess you spent almost all you had on that Dale Carnegie course because it ain't cheap. And so when you put that kind of money in, you're like, well, I put the money in. I'm going to go all in which explains how a market that appears to be saturated actually isn't because it's not saturated with the going to make it people. That's a unique and special attitude. So fast forwarding to your kids, I wish I knew the answer to that because my kids are teenagers and my husband and I have to have this conversation all the time. We've given them too much and my kids aren't even as spoiled as some of their peers but they don't have to go scratch and enforce their way into a scenario because my reputation in this market has opened a lot of doors for them. And then I just have to pray they don't screw up my reputation. And we've never gone without because we work, we save, and we've got a good environment. So it just has to be a really cognizant thought about where you, where you do draw a line. So, for example, we got chickens as a family. And I would guess chickens would be very welcome in Saskatoon. And we We got that did it as a family so that there would be a physical chore associated that's not just cleaning the house, doing the dishes and the laundry is a basic. But when the kids have to go outside and mess with chicken shit and manage a rooster when he goes on the attack, that helps them see the reality of where food comes from. It's fun. And you want to be the one who makes their pathway smoother than the one you had. But dang, I wouldn't trade my pathway for anything. And I always wonder if I've taken something away from them. Yeah, but you know what? That's why I think doing this kind of stuff is important. Podcasting, being a content creator. Because I think what you can give to your kids is the content that you create that tells your story is more important and valuable than any trust fund that they could come into. So one of my favorite podcasts is actually Canadian. It's on the, let's see, is it a CBC one? Oh, it's Apostrophe Network. It's called We Regret to Inform You, the Rejection Podcast. Have you ever listened to it? I haven't, but I like the title already. It's amazing. It's just what you just said. And the guy who does the podcast and his daughter is the producer, said uh, Terry O'Reilly. You know Terry because he's been on Canadian public radio for decades. And his daughter, Sydney, started this out of an Airstream trailer because she wanted to tell some of these stories. And the episodes are wildly all over the place. I mean, you have basketball players and screenwriters and musicians and 
all kinds of people who just got beat down and they kept coming back. And I've listened to that with my kids, because, especially if it's somebody they've heard of, because it helps them know that even the most vaunted people had their knees cut out from under them. So we regret to inform you the rejection podcast. That's what it looks like. It's the little hand up. Yeah, I'll check that out. I met Terry O'Reilly at a real estate event in Ontario, I don't know, seven or eight years ago. And he was my favorite speaker of the day. And I came on the stage after him like, I don't want to go after Terry O'Reilly. That dude's amazing. Then he starts his podcast and it's like candy. I mean, it's healthy candy, I guess. (laughs) Yeah, that's cool. And I think people need that. But I also think that you have to be strict with your kids too. Because if you have a disciplined parent who has their, I don't want to say has their life together, but like has maybe sections of their life together, I should say. Well, I can't. You know, sections can be together. <laughs> that's just real life. But it's just like, you have to be strict with your kids. And sometimes maybe growing up in a family like that would be more strict than it would be when it's kind of like loosey goosey. But then you've got to find your own way, which is half the battle. If you are remotely awake, then you know that we are heading into some really tricky economic times. We have home buyers that have put the kibosh on buying. We have sellers who have found out suddenly their houses aren't dipped in 14 karat gold. And as a realtor, you are still trying to keep up with the business you have and trying to answer questions in the meantime, while also managing sky high fuel cost at the pump. Never fear because my new video course is coming out right now. And it's called how to dominate during a recession. I've been a realtor for 22 years. My business went up every year during the Great Recession, and it's all because of education. This course is four modules. There might even be some bonus content for you. The price is $199. I am delighted to bring this out as quickly as possible because, friends, there's no time like the present to make sure our neighbors are stronger and we protect the American dream. Click on this link, www.dominatethisrecession.com, and I'll see you there. Now, back to this amazing content, because there's so many pathways in real estate, which I find to be one of the least talked about parts of this profession. I went and spoke to a high school last week. The marketing professor wanted me to come talk about real estate, and some of those kids have no intention of going to college. Well, I can talk to them about a surveyor profession, an appraiser profession, They could be all kinds of things in and around real estate, including a practicing agent. All you got to be is 18-year-old with a high school diploma in the U.S. So they didn't know about those pathways, but the conversation then went towards investing. And as it turns out, this bunch of 17 and 18-year-olds is trying to figure out how to create mailbox money so they can choose not to work 10 years from now. And I was like, what a different group of thinkers Then my high school class, which in the dark ages when I graduated from high school, it was still, it wasn't everybody went to college. So it was a goal to go to college. And now I think we've moved into a space of we may have sent some of the wrong people to college and maybe they would do better in a different endeavor. And real estate's got a million pathways from selling to brokering to all of the different specialties, plus the training and the coaching side of it, which you don't even see until you hit a level of success, which obviously that's where you're tapping in now that your team is operating so you can go make them better. It is. I mean, that's a can of worms, that whole conversation about university versus like just life experience and all the things that they don't teach you in school, like sales training. I don't care what job you have. If you're working corporate, you need leadership skills you need sales skills. You got to sell your ideas. You got to sell it yourself like anything. And they just don't teach that in school. Like, okay. you come out- I'm going to ask you a question. Yes. I love how you keep saying things that are reminding me of other cool things. Okay. So on Twitter, which I love Twitter is my favorite dumpster fire to hang out in. There's a leadership guy that I follow and he asked a question. And so you have to give me your answer to this. You ready? Okay. 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 And Chris was not prepped for this guys, obviously, since I got my reading glasses out. All right. You have a kid graduating from high school. Which experience do you want for their last summer before life hits? Okay. Number one, knock 1,000 doors selling anything. Number two, make 10,000 phone calls selling anything. Number Uh, three. Oh, so you've got got four options. Okay. Okay. Number, Number three, following a skilled residential plumber. Number four, running their own lawn mowing company. Oh. (laughs) <laughs> right. You know what? I will say the lawn mowing. I was going to say knocking on doors, but I'm going to say the lawn mowing company. And the reason why is because 
there's a wider plethora of skills you're going to learn in the lawn mowing company. And that's one of the Mm -hmm. most lucrative types of companies that a young kid could get into. And that might require you to knock on a thousand doors anyways. I mean, I always say in person is better than on the phone. Although here in Canada, sometimes it gets really cold. It's not as fun to, although I did that, which by the way, I always talk about that, like the different forms of lead generation, right? Like when I started, I didn't know anybody here because I wasn't from here. And so my sphere of influence was only the people I met at Dale Carnegie and and the people I used to work with in sheet metal, but they're like, forget it, Chris, so you're not going to make it. Don't worry about it. Come fix my furnace. And so I figured out the numbers on this. I knocked on 4,000 doors, talked to a thousand people to make 10 grand. In what time frame? Oh, gee. Well, it would have been a year. Nah, I mean, if you do the math, like if I was to talk to 50 people a day, but that would only if I didn't have appointments, I could talk to 40, 50 people a day. So if you go thousand divided by 50, that's how many days, but I'd feather it into whatever else I had going on once I called all the people that I already knew of or knew. But if I was to call for sale by owners, I wasn't good at it in the beginning. It took me a long time to get good. Once I got good at it, I talked to 65 for sale by owners to get a listing sold to make six, 8,000 bucks. And so, but there's only so many of them. And then within your sphere of influence, it was like 38 people maybe to do deal, but same thing. So that's the power of building your network and reason why it's so much more important. But when you don't know, you got to start like Buffini. Well, that's great. Work by referral. If you don't know anybody, you have to talk to people you don't know and get to know them. It wasn't until later in my career, I started networking in-person events and stuff. And that was a huge comfort zone thing for me, but I wish I would have done more of that in the beginning because the people I met through Dale Carnegie, they see you overcome your fear and be vulnerable and speak in front of a group and you get confident by the end. And they're like, good for this guy. You know, started to dress better towards it from the beginning to the end of the 12 week course. But yeah, the truth of it is it's people, the same thing with going on video. You suck in the beginning and later on you still suck, but you're better. Just kidding, but seriously, but people follow your journey and they respect you for it. And half the people that watch more than half, they're just like, man, good on him for the courage. I wish I had the courage to do that. Just the consistency to want to keep going or whatever it may be. So I mean, you know what they say, if you don't look back and cringe, you haven't grown. And so you should look back and cringe. But to your point with your Dale Carnegie events and networking, that was the trust factor there. And I think that's often overlooked in this space where we're talking about work by referral, you absolutely want to work by referral, but you don't get there until you build some trust. And you can build trust with strangers when you show your own vulnerabilities, whether it's in front of a room full learning how to speak or it's on video. So I think that's a great point well taken that I think we would all wish we could go back earlier in our career and do more of those really good positive activities because we grow and we build business at the same time. And Frankly, if you're building your business and not growing, then that's just kind of dreadful. Then your numbers game is not getting any better. And I also noticed, you know, your numbers really well. When did you start tracking how many appointments it would take you to get a for sale by owner to convert or somebody in your sphere to convert? Did you start that early or was that a lesson hard learned? Um, yeah, it's definitely a lesson learned. I took sales training from Mike Ferry, you know, the original OG. The original, yep. Yeah, yeah. And so he always hammered that in and track your numbers. And so I'm a numbers guy, but I sometimes overthink the numbers. So I, that's a problem too. I'm over analytically, what do they say? Analysis paralysis. But I found a lot of comfort in the numbers because even when you suck, they say you can make up for in numbers, what you lack in skill in the beginning. And so that was definitely my story. Once you know the ratio, Then you can even track how your ratio improves and then also where to spend your time, where you're making money, what makes you more money long-term and short-term. I find comfort in that. As long as there is a ratio, then I know that I can do this and get this result. And that's one thing I find that so many agents, even you get into personalities, but like people that have an expressive personality that are naturally great salespeople or a driver personality who are straight to the point, they get things done. If they don't track their numbers, which is quite common, they get extremely good success in the beginning because they're inspired and motivated brand new with their license. But then they're like, oh my goodness, I don't know how any of that took place. I don't know how to repeat it and duplicate it. And so for me, yeah, it was a slow start. This is me. It's a gift and a curse. It takes me forever to learn anything. So what I have learned is that if it's going to take me forever to learn anything, I might as well pick something that's most valuable. The gift part of it is by the time I learned something, I've went through all the trials and tribulations from every angle that now I know it well enough that I could teach it to anybody like the back of my hand. So it's like leadership skills, sales skills, public speaking, personal finance. They seem like basic things, but they don't teach it in school. And you got to focus on, you can do anything in life 
but you can't do everything. So you got to pick something, ability to make decisions. That's the thing with kids. And same thing that we're talking about is if you have all the opportunities in the world, like today we do with the internet, social media, Google, and even now with artificial intelligence, it's just like you could literally do anything with your life. So the ability to make a decision that much more valuable now too, it's overlooked. Well, I mean, you say you can do anything, but you had two busted Achilles, so you probably can't run a marathon safely. Well, I might not get gold medal. I'm sure that I could, but the question becomes, but back to decision. Well, is that the best decision to try to run a marathon? I feel like your what? wife is going to agree with me on that. And she's going to say, let's find a different activity for you because I don't need mm. you laid up for weeks. <laughs> That's right. That's right. There's nothing wrong with walking to get your exercise. We got a rowing machine now. It's a good one. That's Keep right. It's the upper body, different yeah. muscles. No All sudden right. moves. So you've been in and out of the real estate business, different angles over the last decade. That means you have to have seen some kind of crazy shit that you saw it and you said, am I seriously in the middle of this? So I know my audience is dying to hear a good Canuck story. So you can say a boat one more time. A boat. I love that. (laughs) I actually thought about this because I was listening to your podcast and people come up with these great stories and I had to really think what is one of the best ones that I've been through. And so it was a big 4,000 square foot house in Saskatoon. We have those, believe it or not. There's not too many high-end properties, but this one at one I point I thought they was. were all like ice fishing huts. And so this is a lot bigger yeah. than what my mind saw. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't an igloo or nothing. Just kidding. The 100-year-old house. And what had happened is it, would, it had burnt. And so it had burnt oh. and it burnt the roof. Part of the roof had a hole in it. And I believe probably the insurance company stripped it all down, like took all the drywall off all the walls and the insulation was taken all out of it. And I guess that's what they do. And there was a tarp over the roof and I was showing it to an investor and it was like walking into Skeletor because it's just literally framed in an old shell, hundred years old, but it was like, enter at your own risk. And we got to the two stories with an attic, you know, those old houses and we climbed all the way but the attic was a legitimate full-size living space, but it was like walking up, the plank. And the house has been burned. Y'all went up the stairs. Well, yeah, like the bones seemed to be okay, but it had a hole in the roof. But I remember when you get to the top, which was the attic, it was like, walk the plank. I was like, we really shouldn't be in here. This is not safe. But you could see from the attic off from this plank, you could see all the way down into the basement. And uh, that was one where... I just thought to myself, we should just like maybe poke our head in and then walk out. Yeah. I would get straight vertigo just from the idea of being in an attic and looking down to the basement. I feel like I have vertigo and it wasn't me in the house. Yeah, it was a giant house. I don't know how many times you working with investors, when you take the plywood off and go in, it's like, maybe we shouldn't go in. (laughs) You're like, sign this waiver real quick and make sure you know you might fall through the floor. So did that original homeowner take the insurance money and run and not put it back into the house? I'm thinking that's probably what happened, but it was in a premium location and it was a big, big, big house with decent bones. But we started looking at like, by the time you get into the renovation costs, should we just rebuild? Like it was a real dilemma. And I don't know who bought it, what they did with it, but it'd be interesting to go check it out. It is interesting when you look at a house that's that age and part of you emotionally wants to bring it back because a hundred year old house, obviously craftsman era, it's just a different kind of quality and different kind of house. But then the financial aspect has to play in. And that's what's hard for regular home buyers to get past is the non-emotional part. The investors only look at the numbers. The homeowner looks at the emotion and the realtor has to bring the two together. You should totally look that up and go drive by it and see what they did to it and see if they saved it. Yeah, I think I will. Hopefully it's not a condo building now because that will be depressing. Yeah, that would be unfortunate. So Chris, if somebody wants to reach out to you to learn more about your career, your sales and coaching and life in Saskatoon, what's the best way for them to find you? Yeah, I say look me up on Instagram, uh, Chris Molinar. My last name's M O L E N A A R. Or you can look me up on YouTube. Same thing. Get to know a little more what I'm about and definitely happy to connect for sure. Why is your handle not Chris the Canadian? That's easier to spell than Molinar. I don't know. Maybe I should pick an easier tagline. Building the name, right? So there you go. Yeah. It'll be recognizable. That's true. And for those of y'all that didn't write it down and now in your head, it's Chris the Canadian. You don't remember it's Molinar. Don't worry because all of his handles, information, website, and phone numbers are in the show notes for this episode. So you can reach out and ask any questions and hear more about 
this kind of persistence because that's what it's going to take as the markets continue to express some volatility. But hey, houses are bought and sold no matter what. So you may as well be the one that's selling them. Chris, thank you so much for coming on the show and giving us a little bit of insight and then playing along with two surprise pieces of information that you brought to me. So I love that. It was a lot of fun. Thank you so much. All right, guys, make sure you say something nice in the comments. And I actually want to hear what you would do of those four options for that young person, whether it's knock a thousand doors, make 10,000 phone calls, follow a plumber, or start a landscaping lawn mowing business. We want to hear what you would do. And then make sure that you hit the bell and come back and visit us over here on Crazy Shit. Chris, thanks. And we'll see you next time. As always, I'm so super thrilled that you joined in for more Crazy Shit. And if you're a realtor, investor, inspector, lender, or just a regular human being who happens to have an unbelievable story that you need to tell the world about, or frankly, you just need to one of the story you just heard, then make sure to DM me on Instagram at Lee Thomas Brown or tweet me at Lee Brown or frankly any social network where you hang out. I'm there. And if you had some fun, then you totally want to subscribe so you don't miss out on any future episodes. 